This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalbathanchel. When you're out shopping for soap or shampoo, how closely are you looking at the label? You may already be wary of parabens or know about microbeads, which were banned in the U.S. in 2015. But have you heard of PFAS? It stands for per and polyfluoroalkyl substances, man-made chemicals found in a wide array of products used for its waterproofing or non-stick properties. They're dubbed forever chemicals and have turned up across the country in the sea, soil, and air. And for nine out of 10 of us, in our blood. And PFAS are not on the label, yet. Similarly, tiny bits of eroded plastic waste called microplastics have also been found in our environment and in our bodies. Today, where we live, we learned about efforts to monitor the prevalence and impact of these contaminants in Connecticut, particularly in our drinking water and in Long Island Sound. Now, what questions do you have? You can join us. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. Here more on Zoom with us is Dr. J. Evan Ward, who's professor and head of UConn's Marine Sciences Department. Evan, welcome to our show. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you. And also with us on Zoom, Sylvain DeGee is a professor and director of Connecticut Sea Grant at UConn's Avery Point campus. Sylvain, welcome to our show. Good morning, Lucy. And when I mention the Sea Grant program, that is the state and federal partnership through UConn and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's National Sea Grant College program. I'll start with you, Evan. I mentioned microplastics. So how prevalent are they in Long Island Sound? What do we know? So first, the listeners should understand that microplastics is a broad umbrella term for a variety of different uh, particles. So I like to think about microplastics like candy. So if you say candy, it conjures up all different types of candy, different sizes, different shapes, made of different things. There's dark chocolate, milk chocolate, hard candy, et cetera. So when you say microplastics, it's, it's the same thing. You're talking about a wide range of synthetic polymers that are found in the environment. And before I answer your question, I'll just say that, um, The concentrations in Long Island Sound and elsewhere vary considerably depending upon population density, depending on uh, tides, and winds, and all different types of uh, physical characteristics in the water. So it's not an easy uh, question to answer. But in Long Island Sound, from our research, we're finding that there are anywhere between one and a couple microplastics per liter of water in Long Island Sound. And those microplastics, like I said, vary in their synthetic composition. Now, when we talk about the the different uh, types of microplastics, uh, and you mentioned it's not an easy question to answer, they're invisible to the naked eye. And so how do you go about testing? Yeah. So um, there are a number of different ways to do that. Some individuals will use nets to um, pull through the water to collect the small particles. But those nets only trap particles that are fairly large, things that you can almost see with your naked eye to just below what you can see with your naked eye. But there are a lot of microplastics that are very much smaller, as you said, below what you can see with your naked eye. So the process usually entails taking volumes of water, then filtering that water, and then placing the material that you filter into substances that have various densities. So those plastic particles float, and then you can collect the floated particles, refilter them, and then you can analyze them using spectroscopy. Mm. So how long have researchers been looking for microplastics and analyzing what they've found in Long Island Sound, Evan? In Long Island Sound, not too long. So I would say uh, we were one of the first to look at microplastics in Long Island Sound, and that only goes back to about 2015. However, the um, idea that there were small plastic particles in seawater dates back to about the 1970s, late 1970s. And uh, various not-for-profit organizations like SEA became aware of the problem and started sampling uh, during their uh, field trips with students, sampling water using nets to collect plastic particles that you could see, but still pretty small plastic particles. So that happened in the 80s and 90s, and they have a very good um, database for 
plastic particles that are between, I don't know, something like a fraction of an inch to about an inch. You know, earlier I mentioned microbeads, which were banned in 2015, mm-hmm. but uh, through your research, are they still turning up? Um, actually, no. Uh, the most prevalent microplastic that we see are fibers. So fibers come from a variety of different sources, from our clothing, right? So you wash your clothes. Most of our clothing are synthetic polymers, and those little fibers that are released during the washing cycle end up going down the drain and going out to the environment in a variety of different ways. Um, And also, you can have fibers uh, fraying from lines, from boating activities, and other types of activities. So fibers really are what we see mostly in the environment, followed next by fragments. So things that are chipping off of plastic bottles, chipping off of um, buoys and things like that. When we think about the health of Long Island Sound and the the shellfish that are there, what does research tell you about um, how shellfish react to these microplastics, Evan? Yeah, so so that's actually a good news story. Um, We've done quite a bit of work looking at how oysters and mussels and some other Uh, shellfish capture microplastics and ingest microplastics. So although they do capture pretty much all the microplastics that are out there, um, bivalves have an extraordinary ability to do something called particle selection. And so prior to ingestion, they can sort particles and spit out a lot of the particles that are not nutritious. So it turns out that they can spit out a lot of the microplastics And so what happens is, is that when you take a look at the load of microplastics in shellfish in Long Island Sound, it's pretty low. It's only a couple microplastics per animal. So given what you said, they're not a great indicator of maybe that there might be a certain prevalence of microplastics in a specific part of Long Island Sound. What about um, other fish? So um, really, if you're looking at the, uh, a bioindicator of microplastics, you need something that is a filter feeder that can filter large volumes of water per unit time and something that doesn't particle select. So you're right, bivalves we have found are really not good indicators of microplastics in the environment. But there are other filter feeders out there that could be good indicators. And in fact, we are working on, uh, on that. And that uh, project is funded by a Long Island Sound Study. And some of it's also funded by Connecticut Sea Grant. You're listening to Where We Live as we talk about man-made contaminants in our environment from microplastics to PFAS, which stands for per and polyfluoroalkyl substances that's used in a wide array of products. Uh, You've been hearing from Dr. J. Evan Ward, professor and head of UConn's Marine Sciences Department. As I mentioned, Sylvain de Guise is also here, UConn professor and director of Connecticut Sea Grant at UConn's Avery Point campus. So Sylvain, talk more with us about PFAS and how ubiquitous they are. Lucy, um, f- f- first and foremost, PFAS is actually a family of chemicals. It's not an individual chemical. And, and like a number of chemicals, there's older generation and there's newer generation uh, compounds as, that are part of PFAS. So it's not one chemical, it's a family of chemicals. They're manufactured, they're man-made, and they're used because they repel oil and water. They're hydrophobic. And because of that, they've been used in a number of consumer products from the stain repellent in, in your carpet or on your couch or on your pants to the nonstick pans to uh, the microwave popcorn bags. Um, and they're also used in a number of industrial applications like the uh, uh, aqueous firefighting foams that are often used in airports. And you might remember a recent spill in the Farmington River. Uh, because they're so broadly used and because they're really, really hard to break down, which is one of the reasons they're manufactured in, in the first place, um, they're now found everywhere. They're found um, in, in the environment and they're found in the blood of humans and wildlife as well uh, across the globe. Mm. 
And coming up, we're going to be talking with the Connecticut Department of Public Health about uh, PFAS, uh, uh, many of these chemicals that have been found in groundwater and how uh, the Department of Public Health is is analyzing uh, groundwater around our state. But when we think about uh, Sea Grant's work, I understand there was a contaminants of emerging concern project, Sylvain. So how do both PFAS and microplastics factor in that survey? So we... Uh, um as you know, Congress allocates funds to different agencies. And in the last couple of years, I've tasked Sea Grant to do some work on, on chemicals of emerging concern. And I was uh, leading a group to do a scoping exercise. There, there's a number of entities, including a number of federal and state agencies that are tasked to deal with different chemicals of emerging concern. But by definition, they're of emerging concern. So they're not very, they're, they're not very well known their distribution and their toxicity are not fully understood. And there's a number of, of, of different agencies that look at, at different aspects of that. Um, and we uh, did a, a national scoping exercise to understand who does what and what might be a, a strategic role for Sea Grant to play. And, and, and some of the outcomes of that scoping exercise are quite interesting. <laughs> for example, um, there's a number of agencies that study humans and other agencies that study the environment. And uh, we, uh, we task Sea Grant, we challenge Sea Grant to consider humans as part of the environment as opposed to separate under a concept of one health. Um, another example of, of what came out of that is that there's uh, uh, important research that, that's taking place, but Sea Grant is fairly well known to inc include research outreach and education. And we, we challenge Sea Grant to continue to, to use that, that framework for research on chemicals of emerging concern, not only to discover new aspects of those, of those chemicals, but also to transfer that information to the population for everybody's benefit. You mentioned uh, several times contaminants of emerging concern. So these are also chemicals that are not regulated, Sylvain, right now? That is correct. That mm -hmm. Those are chemicals that are um, newly recognized as more prevalent in the environment than we first thought or, or whose effects are not fully understood. So it's hard to regulate something you don't fully understand um, as opposed to legacy contaminants like PCBs that have been studied for 30, 40 years. They're well understood. They're, they're now well regulated. Their manufacturing has been regulated as, as actually stopped uh, across the world. Uh, so that the uh, by contrast, chemicals of emerging concern are not well understood, and we're still trying to wrap our hands around what, what are the most important aspects of it and who should regulate them. Um, so you mentioned you know, there's still a lot that's not known, but can we talk a little bit about um, some of the studies that have been done? And let's start with you know, how microplastics and PFAS might, may interact in the environment, Sylvain. Yeah, uh, so... Um, uh, PFAS are water repellent, so they don't they don't like to be in water. But but there are things like microplastics that um, uh, easily attract chemicals like PFAS. PFAS can ad adsorb to the surface of microplastics. So when a fish ingests a piece of microplastic, it does not only ingest the, the, the physical thing and its chemical comp components, but it also ingests the other chemicals like PFAS or even PCBs that absorb absorbed to their surface, uh, so it's a it's a it's a dual trap, right? It's a it's a it's a combined effect, and we are really not very good at understanding combined effects of chemicals. Mm. I understand that CDC has listed uh, some of the harmful effects of PFAS, including cancer, liver damage, decreased fertility. And so, what do we know about these long-term effects of PFAS, Sylvain? Well, our lab has focused on the immune system, uh, which is uh, when you have a cancer, it, it can be fairly obvious and it's something you can point your finger to. Um, effects on the immune system are much more subtle and, and, and they're not as obvious. But like for generations of people dying with AIDS, they don't die of AIDS, they die of the infections that their immune system can no longer take care of. Uh, we've also found over the years that the immune system is one of the systems that is the most sensitive to the effects of, of chemical uh, pollutants. And our lab has done a, a, a series of mouse studies that are, are focused on low dose exposure for a longer term. And we found that the effects of, of PFAS in mice uh, exposed for a longer time are much more marked 
and at much lower concentrations than previous studies have demonstrated. And, and, and this is an important concept because uh, it's, it's certainly a lot easier and a lot cheaper to do short-term studies, but it, it may not tell the full, the full story. And it's very relevant to, uh, to human exposure that is usually long-term, low dose, often across a lifetime. So given what you shared, you're now looking at these long-term effects on, in mice on both the cellular and molecular levels? That is correct. So our, our, our studies have uncovered maybe new aspects of, of the, the um, uh, mechanisms of action of, of PFAS. And, and, and we're now focusing on understanding the earlier effects at the individual cell and, and, and molecule to, to better understand how they're triggered and, and therefore be able to at some point maybe uh, uh, mitigate them or, or, or treat them. I mentioned the Connecticut Sea Grant Program. That's a consortium involving several states. And so I'm just wondering if you can talk a little bit more about how you're collaborating with scientists in our region. Yeah, um, Sea Grant is a, is a distributed program. So there's a, it's a national program with offices in each of the coastal and Great Lakes states trying to incorporate research, outreach, and education. Uh, and Sea Grant funds research. For example, we funded some of... Uh, Evans' research on microplastics. We are also funding right now a project on PFAS and shellfish close to the airport in Groton. We know that uh, a lot of uh, firefighting foams are used in, in airports and sometimes leak out. And that seems like a, a, a nice place to start looking for, for the, the leaking in the environment and how that might be uh, incorporated by a shellfish, uh, including through the food chain. Of shellfish. So I, I, by looking at early events in the food chain, we might better understand the processes that lead to accumulation of PFAS in other species, including predator species and humans. Mm. Uh, you'd mentioned earlier with this uh, umbrella group of, of these man-made chemicals, often just mentioned as PFAS. Uh, there's still a lot that's not known. But getting back to microplastics, what do we know about their impact on humans and, and also wildlife? Yeah, uh, Evan might be uh, uh, better than me to to address the specifics, but but we know that there's effects associated with the chemical components of microplastic. There's also effects that might be related to the, the 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 physical aspects of those microplastics. If you ingest too much, for example, if you're a small a small fish, it might affect your gastrointestinal tract and your ability to absorb nutrients. Mm. Evan, you're still here with us again, professor and head of UConn's Marine Sciences Department. So uh, again, when we think about um, microplastics and being harmful to humans and also what we know about how they impact wildlife. Right. So with uh, shellfish, the data to date suggests that at environmentally relevant concentrations, remember I was saying that there's only a few to 10 microplastic particles per liter in Long Island Sound. So at environmentally relevant concentrations the effects are negligible, if any. Now, I have to say, however, these were done, these results are from relatively short-term studies. And as Sylvain pointed out, the short-term studies um, are less expensive to conduct, a little easier to conduct, but sometimes they don't show the true effects. So there are very few long-term studies on environmentally environmentally relevant concentrations of microplastics on things like shellfish. There are some that are being funded now. There is one that was um, out of uh, Germany, I think, just recently. So there's a lot more work to do. But with shellfish at environmentally relevant concentrations uh, with short-term exposures, there does not seem to be any major effects of microplastics. If you're talking about birds and fishes and mammals with macroplastics, then those uh, effects have been documented. And as Sylvain had suggested, there's um, effects caused by blockage of the intestine, entanglement, um, and other effects. And there are some effects of uh, chemical composition or chemicals leaking from the macroplastics in the gut of the mammals or the birds that can cause uh, problems. Mm. 
Uh, for our listeners, you know, we know that Connecticut has banned plastic shopping bags, but you know, there's a lot of uh, plastic waste that exists that are generated, um, that are used in households. And so I'm wondering, Evan, when we, when listeners are hearing uh, you and Sylvain talk uh, about the impacts, what is known, and what still needs to be uh, researched, uh, thinking about ways what they can consider, uh, given what you're noticing in your fields about again the plastic weight waste and, and where it ends up. I would say the listeners probably all know that when you drive down Connecticut roads, if you look on the side of the road, pretty much every so many, you know, hundred yards, you will see plastic bottles, right? Um, And if you haven't noticed that, start taking notice that the plastic bottles and other plastic materials just line our roads and those eventually end up in rivers and in Long Island Sound. And when they're weathered through aging process, through um, UV exposure, they become brittle and then they break apart and they form microplastics. So that's where a lot of our microplastics are coming from as well. And so we really need to be conscious about where we're putting our plastics. Um, Some people just throw plastics out the window. I don't think most of us do that, but they escape, right? Plastics are light. They're easily blown out of the back of a pickup truck or, you know, out of your shopping cart and things like that. So we really need to be cognizant of how we handle these plastics to limit their um, um, escape into the environment. So um, certainly reduce the number of bottles you use, plastic bottles, plastic films, plastic sheets, as much as possible. We are working with companies uh, from uh, Italy looking at uh, truly um, biodegradable or compostable plastics. So those are things that need to come onto the market. So if they do escape into the environment, after six months or a year, they will break down and no longer be there. Um, so those are some of the things I, I would say, you know, the, the old uh, adage to reduce, reuse and recycle. Right. Mm. Thank you for that, Evan. Uh, Sylvain, did you want to add to that? Yeah. Uh, along the same lines, we continue to, to support, for example, beach cleanups. And for five or six years now, we, we've worked with uh, EPA, Long Island Sound Study and New York Secret to coordinate uh, a Don't Trash Long Island Sound campaign that uh, brings attention to uh, reducing uh, single-use plastics. Uh, and uh, it comes with uh, bright colored stickers related to, to Long Island Sound that are more and more visible now that people put on their uh, reusable water bottles. Uh, so, w- so when you see those around, you, you, can, you can think of uh, efforts that are made to uh, both clean up uh, the plastics on the beaches, but also to reduce the, the, the use of single use, use plastic. And uh, I'll say that the next generation is, is getting more and more aware through uh, educational programs. And that uh, often has a very uh, sharp a- impact uh, socially. That's Sylvain de Guise, UConn professor and director of Connecticut Sea Grant at UConn's Avery Point campus. Thank you for your time today, Sylvain. Thank you, Lucy. Also with us, Dr. J. Evan Ward, professor and head of UConn's Marine Sciences Department. Evan, we appreciate your time as well. Well, thank you for inviting me. This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. Coming up after the break, PFAS in Connecticut groundwater is a particular concern for the State Department of Public Health. We learn about surveillance efforts and take your questions, too. You can join us or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. We were talking about PFAS or per and polyfluoral alkyl substances. They're known as forever chemicals. They're used in industry and consumer products, and they take many years to break down. The CDC says most people have been exposed to PFAS. They're present in soil, air, and water. Now, you may recall hearing about PFAS in 2019 when firefighting foam at Bradley Airport spilled and then flowed downstream into the Farmington River. More 
recently, the Connecticut Mirror reported last August about concerns over well water in Killingworth, Connecticut. State officials warned Killingworth town officials after analyzing water samples. The Mirror reports those results marked one of the first times that Connecticut officials uncovered widespread drinking water contamination tied to PFAS. Now, what do state environmental and health officials know about groundwater contamination now in sites across Connecticut. Joining us now on Zoom is Lori Matthew, branch chief of the Connecticut Department of Public Health's Environmental and Drinking Water Section. Lori, welcome to our show. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me, inviting the Connecticut Department of Public Health. Now our listeners can join with questions. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at where we live. So when when we talk about PFAS, is this a primary concern for the Department of Public Health? It is. It is one of the emerging contaminants of concern. Um, it is one of the emerging contaminants. As I heard and listened in on the, the past discussion, uh, as the professors had mentioned, uh, this is an, a, non, a non-regulated contaminant. And as a non-regulated, a non-regulated contaminant, it's been, it's been studied uh, under the Safe Drinking Water Act uh, for possible regulation. So um, back years ago, under the Safe Drinking Water Act, there were reviews and occurrence data um, testing that was done of public water systems across the country. Uh, In Connecticut, you know, that was conducted from 2013 to 2015. Um, Nothing was found at that moment in time, but science has changed, detection limits have changed. Um, And as you previously just mentioned, the most recent uh, situation in Killingworth um, through some testing that came about because of the governor's task force um, that was pulled together as directed by Governor Ned Lamont in 2019, uh, we came together as two agencies, Department of Public Health and DPH, uh, pulled together 20 other agencies across the state and put together a, st- a strategic plan and action plan for the governor. Um, and what it said is that public water systems should be testing their water. Again, this is not regulated but we've recommended testing for our public water systems uh, and that testing continued on. And that's how in Killingworth, uh, the, uh, this whole, whole uh, discovery was found. Uh, Connecticut Water Company owns a small system in Killingworth. They were testing their, their supplies as a public water system. Again, not a regulatory requirement, but they were doing what we recommended uh, under the Department of Public Health. And they found PFAS at elevated levels uh, then once that was found, we worked with the town, the local health director, the first select people um, to test more. And as we tested more private wells and other public wells within the, the Killingworth Center area, we found it to be a prevalent um, concern in the groundwater. And so because it's a prevalent concern, there are residents in, in Killingworth right now that are still relying on bottled water, Lori? That, that is correct. Um, our colleagues, uh, together with the State Department of Public Health, the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, work with the local health director, uh, as well as the, the first select people in Killingworth, to develop a plan. Part of the plan is to provide, um, immediately provide um, water for people to drink, especially in the private well side. There are uh, quite a few private wells that were contaminated uh, that had elevated levels uh, above our action level of 70 parts per trillion, some of five PFAS chemicals. So the ones that were elevated, um, the private wells that were elevated, were provided um, treatment systems and bottled water. Uh, so right now there are um, individual homes on private wells that have treatment units in place. Um, and there are public supplies and the, the town hall, the school, um, that's in the area has been provided bottled water. Um, and so now that's the intermediate, uh, immediate plan. Uh, and now there's, um, much study going on about where the groundwater contamination had come from, uh, as well as what are the long-term, what's the long-term vision to help this area out with, uh, a, a sustainable source of, uh, public water that is, um, you know, that is PFAS free. I understand there have also been uh, samples and water found to have these chemicals in, in the town of Weston. Yes, yes. Recently, um, the town of Weston uh, was conducting a review of their their town system. They have a town system that serves the, uh, the commercialized area, the sort of the community center area in the town of Weston, they tested those wells that serve the schools, the town hall, all the municipal buildings, 
uh, some commercial properties and they found elevated PFAS there. Um, they were concerned. Uh, they worked with us, again, our team uh, of, you know, us and DEP um, to determine what next steps. Um, they immediately moved to design treatment uh, for that. And they're in the middle of a pilot test for a treatment system uh, for those two particular wells. And again, they're also looking at where's this coming from? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not, um, you know, well understood immediately where the PFAS contamination has, um, has how it has affected the well and how it, it has affected the groundwater. Um, and it's a lot of work and study to an effort to try to determine the exact cause. Uh, you're mentioning you're hitting on a lot of points that, that are in this 2019 action plan uh, that you had referenced earlier. For people who are listening who have well water, they may not live in Killingworth or Weston, but I'm um, wondering when we talk about how the science is evolving, the testing that's available, the cost, what do you recommend to, to listeners? Well, the for public water, obviously, in, in the action plan, you know, under Governor Lamont was was that we we want our water systems, our public water systems that are regulated in the state, which there are 2,400, by the way, <laughs> regulated public water systems in our state. We've asked all of those systems to test, um, and specifically the the community based where people live. Um, we've asked them to test, and again, it's a recommendation. It's a recommendation to test. For private well owners, um, we don't suggest that you run out and spend, you know, you can spend between $350 to $400 for a PFOS test. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's quite an expensive test. Uh, for private well owners, I'm glad you brought it up. I, I would recommend strongly that if you haven't tested your private well in a long time, that you should. For some of the most basic things, you know, test for, uh, you have great information on our Department of Public Health's webpage. If you Google private well uh, testing Connecticut Department of Public Health, our webpage will pop up. It'll give you the laundry list of items that we, we suggest you test for, which would be E. coli, the nitrates, the iron, manganese, uh, uranium, arsenic, those types of things that we know are in the ground. Um, and they are known contaminants in the ground. And um, again, more information you can find on our webpage for testing private wells. Again, you're hearing Lori Matthew here on the show, branch chief of the Connecticut Department of Public Health's Environmental and Drinking Water section. As we talk about PFAS, you can join us. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at where we live. So we talked about Weston. Would that be the most recent example of where a PFAS has been found in, in, in water, Lori? Yes. Yes, um, exactly that. In, in the drinking water, that is the most recent case. So you may have heard of uh, PFAS and fish in the Hockenham River. Um, there has been, again, these are my colleagues at the Department of Environmental uh, uh, Energy, Environmental Protection, that were uh, conducting um, uh, fish sampling um, across the state, and I believe 34, 35 uh, individual locations at specific locations on rivers. And uh, the one uh, prevalent location that came up uh, where there were elevated uh, PFAS found in fish were along the Hockenham River. So right now we have a fish advisory. That's my toxicologists and epidemiologists work with DEP on issuing the fish advisory uh, and the signs are posted all along a 13 mile stretch of the Housatonic River. And, it, and that stretches from the Rockville part of Vernon into Vernon into Ellington, uh, through Vernon again into Manchester and, and East Hartford. And, and it ends at the where the Hockenham uh, uh, flows into the Connecticut River. So that's still, you know, that's one of the most recent mm -hmm. um, uh, situations that uh, we have been uh, working on. And again, the information came due to testing of fish by our Department of uh, Energy and Environmental Protection. Uh, Senator Richard Blumenthal has said the pollution to Connecticut's rivers and soil was, quote, partly because of neglect and ignorance, but also the failure to act. And so I'm wondering if you can talk more about that when we think about setting a, a maximum contaminant level for PFAS. I think states in our region have done so. So what's the latest with Connecticut? You know, that's a good, I was at that press conference when he said that. Um, the time has come and I, we, we certainly agree in the health department and that's why Governor Lamont said we need to, we need to get caught up. We need to take the lead uh, because EPA is not setting a maximum contaminant level soon enough. 
We know that there are uh, health effects. We've seen, my, I, I, you know, have in my group, we have toxicologists, very, very bright people that have been studying and looking at the research on PFAS and impact of public health and human health. Um, more and more research comes out seemingly, you know, every month on the human health impacts and, you know, initial, uh, you know, research was, was on animals, but now it's more and more pointing toward human impact and pointing toward cancer. Um, and so what we have done in Connecticut, we've set an action level um, uh, years ago under Dr. Gary Ginsburg, who now works for the state of New York, but our toxicologists at the time in 2016 set what was one of the more groundbreaking uh, action levels across the country in 2016 of 70 parts per trillion, some of five. Mm -hmm. That's where we are today, but we have through our toxicologist uh, Cheryl Fields and our lead epidemiologist uh, Meg Harvey have taken a careful look at where we need to go. Um, so we do, we do know, and we're very cognizant and we do a lot of, we spend an enormous amount of time looking and working at what other states are doing. Um, because again, EPA has not taken the leadership here. Mm -hmm. And typically under Safe Drinking Water Act, what happens is when you set a maximum contaminant level, you set it across the country based upon that occurrence data that I mentioned previously. That's a really important process that has sort of broken down. We haven't had a maximum contaminant level set in a very long time under the Safe Drinking Water Act. So many states around us, you know, New York, Massachusetts, Vermont, uh, New Hampshire, Maine, and, and Rhode Island, uh, New Jersey, others, um, you know, Pennsylvania, uh, Michigan, uh, others have set maximum contaminant levels because they have found very high levels of contamination in the ground. Mm. A lot of this started in, in the New England uh or the Northeast region because of Hoosick Falls in New York. Um, that goes back to 2015 or 2016 timeframe when they were doing that occurrence data and they found very high levels. Now they found it high in Bennington, Vermont. Then they found it elevated levels in uh, Westfield, Massachusetts. Then they found it in Fort Pease in New Hampshire. And those, and then on Cape, those are the examples that really hit the public in 2015 and 2016, where those states, because of those elevated levels, started setting maximum contaminant levels. They started down that road. Uh, we, again, to go back, we in Connecticut didn't find those high levels. We have found it, you know, as you mentioned when you started this discussion, um, you know, the, the foam release into, you know, from the uh, from the hangar up at the Bradley Airport into the Farmington River, and then a couple months go by. If you remember the unfortunate plane crash. Yes. That also <laughs> foam was used and a lot of it was captured, but still got into the same reach of the Farmington River. And so, um, you know, those are the things that started us on our road, along with the leadership of Governor, Governor Lamont and directing our two agencies to work, pull together this broad based group of agencies in Connecticut uh, to develop a task force and develop an action plan. And to this day, it's been three years. Um, we continue to do an enormous amount of work between our teams. I'm very proud to say that we've been able, you know, again, through the support of the governor and Commissioner Jitani, uh, and Commissioner Gifford before her, uh, the support of um, funding to help um, with staffing, because it takes, it's a lot of work and you need staff to be able to work with public water systems, private well owners, local health directors, uh, chief elected officials. The one thing about PFAS that I can tell you from my perspective is that it it it's unknown. There's a lot of unknowns. And it, it when people were hearing about it in 2019 into 2020 before COVID, they were quite scared about it. Um, you know, now three years have gone by. Our colleagues at Deep have done a, an amazing job with um, reducing future releases from firefighting foam by by taking back that firefighting foam. They've, they've, they've spent an enormous amount of time on that work. And that's, that's an, an excellent effort. That's one of the many efforts that they have done along with testing fish and trying to, you know, find out more. We need more of a baseline though. You know, the future is that. The future is more testing. 
We've been hearing uh, Lori Matthew, again, branch chief of the Connecticut Department of Public Health's Environmental and Drinking Water Section. You mentioned, uh, you know, three years have passed uh, since uh, the action plan and, and some of those events that have been the catalyst. But in terms of thinking about, you know, all of the resources that have been spent on fighting the pandemic, uh, you know, DPH, you feel like you have enough resources to, to continue uh, with the surveilling the, the drinking water and making sure that it's safe for our residents? You know, the, the pandemic has slowed us a bit, I will tell you, because many of us um, in, in March, when we were all sent home as state agencies, telework was a prevalent work practice. And a lot of us got turned into people working on COVID in the health department. Um, and rightly so, because it was a sustained emergency, like whoever knew, right? When we were sent home, we thought we'd be back in two weeks, but that was not the case. And so we've we've done a lot of work with COVID, but we've also done, we also kept up the work with PFAS. I, I will tell you one thing that another, it does take staff and we've been able to hire two new staff. Uh, we're looking forward to hiring two additional, uh, actually three additional staff with state funding. And you, and you need that work. You need that, those people to be able to do the job because once more testing happens, uh, if we are going down the road of setting a, a lower action level at some point in the future, that will trigger a lot more work. We've also been able to secure, again, through state funding with the support of the governor um, and, uh, and as identified in the action plan, um, equipment at our state lab, our state department of public health laboratory uh, has equipment in place. They are now, uh, it's up and running and they're testing that equipment for testing PFAS. We didn't have that, we didn't have that capability in the past. We all recognized when we got together back in 2019 that the state of Connecticut public lab needed that capacity. It's not, it's not to be used broadly, but it's to be used for special investigations and to help the people that need it the most. We have many disadvantaged communities across our state and people that need help with the technology, with understanding and with understanding how, how PFOS could impact them. So we're going to utilize the technology at the lab and working with uh, um, Dr. Razik, uh, who is the executive director at the lab, and his team, Sue Ish and the people there, um, to help us um, you know, offer sampling to the people that need it the most. We're, we're looking at who they, who they are, uh, public water system-based um, sampling, um, and that's going to start rolling out later this summer in, into the fall. So we're very excited about that. But it does take it does take time and money, and it takes expertise. And I've got to give Pat Pisaki a lot of credit in our team. She's led our PFOS team for years and years, and is a technical expert and has studied and worked with other states across the country. So we have a very good team in place with our colleagues Ray Fregon and Graham Stevens and Shannon Polk Chu over at Deep. We're a very good team. Um, and we're a strong team together as two agencies, and then the other agencies around that make an important effort um, because it, you can't do this alone, right. just as even one agency. Well, Lori, we'll, Lori, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you so much sure. for joining with us to talk about the work that's being done. Lori Matthew with the Connecticut Department of Public Health. This is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Coming up, we're going to talk to a Connecticut woman who uses her artwork to raise awareness about ocean pollution. Stay with us. This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Joining us now on Zoom is Elizabeth Ellenwood. She's an artist from Pocketuck, and she was recently awarded a Fulbright Research Scholarship and an American Scandinavian Foundation grant, rather, to travel to Norway, where she's been working with environmental chemists and marine biologists to produce scientifically informed photographs focusing on ocean pollution. She uses her artwork to draw attention to ocean pollution. Elizabeth, welcome to our show. Thanks so much for having me. It's really great to uh, to be able to connect in different countries. Now, your sand and plastic collection series uses yeah. petri dishes, showing how microplastic pollution is studied. Some of those images are on our website, ctpublic.org slash where we live for our listeners. But you've long had a long relationship with the ocean. And so when did you pivot and think about how to use your art uh, to draw awareness to the microplastic pollution around the globe? Yeah, definitely. Um, 
a little background about me. I grew up on on the water, by the water, near the water, um, both in Florida and Connecticut. And um, I didn't start making artwork about it, though, until graduate school at the University of Connecticut. Um, so that was, I believe I started my project called Among the Tides in 20, uh, 2018, maybe. Um, so I was, I was in graduate school and, you know, your, your thesis time comes around and you're supposed to be making, uh, making a big, uh, series specific to a subject. And I love the ocean so much. So it kind of turned into this like really great moment of finding a place where my love of the ocean and then my background and knowledge and art and photography kind of mixed together and it became it became something that I'm like really excited about, honestly. The hour has flown by and we unfortunately yeah. don't have a lot of time with you, but can you That's describe okay. maybe one of the, uh, the pieces that you've worked on and, and how people respond when they see it? Yeah, of course. Um, I'm just one, I'm trying to think of just <laughs> one off the top of my head. Um, you know what, I'll go with like, I just gave a, a presentation at the Arctic Frontiers Conference up in uh, Tromsø, Norway. And I started with an image that's, um, it's an image of, of two images, actually. It's a, a water bottle um, on the on one side. There's a water bottle and it's in seaweed and it's hiding on the rocks. And then the image on the right is also a water bottle uh, on, on rocks in seaweed. And the idea is one is from Westerly, Rhode Island, and one is from Trondheim, Norway. But it's it's the exact it's the exact same. It's both a water bottle in the landscape where it doesn't belong. Um, so it's this idea of being able to show people the fact that not only is is the plastic pollution a huge problem locally where everyone is, but it's also just this global issue. Um, so it's it's trying to get people to realize that our choices as consumers truly do matter, um, right? So even if we're not seeing where where the pollution's ending up, like uh, like Evan was was bringing up about um, about all the plastics and the Connecticut roadways, like it, it's still there and our choices totally do matter. So that's kind of the artwork um, that I'm trying to go for is to remind people of that. Again, the pictures mm-hmm. of that artwork that you described on our website, ctpublic.org slash where we live. I had mentioned mm-hmm. earlier that, you know, you're working with scientists uh, to produce yeah. scientifically informed photographs that focus on ocean pollution. We'd love to have you back on the show when you return yeah. from Norway yeah. to talk more. I would love that. <laughs> yeah, I would really love that. Please reach out because it, I'm learning so much here and I really want to bring it home and, and have more conversations and, and try to figure out more collaboration pieces with with multiple people. So this would be really great. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much mm-hmm. for uh, for letting our listeners know about your work. Uh, I'm sure yeah. that um, the response uh, will be immense, again, when we think about uh, the human impact on our planet and the ways that you're uh, highlighting that uh, in your artwork. Elizabeth Ellenwood, again, an artist from Pocketuck. She's in Norway. She's using her artwork to draw attention to ocean pollution and climate change. We'll love to have you back later this year, Elizabeth. Yes, that'd be great. Thank you so much. You've been listening to Where We Live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Today's show produced by Katie Pellico. Our technical director is Kat Pastor. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.